<laughs> ah, here we go. Ah oui, c'est vrai. Oui, oui, je confonds. Hein? Good morning, everyone. I think we will need to start. If you can take your take a seat, please. Good morning and welcome everyone to, to this very early morning session. <laughs> Thank you for everyone who made it here uh, on time and for being here so early. I admire you and thank you for that. Uh, my name is Lena Hansen. I am a coordinator of initiatives with the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this session this morning. So this is an event co-organized by the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation together with uh, Guillaume Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research Kiel, the French National Scientific Research Center, CNRS, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and Climate Works Foundation. So on behalf of all uh, the organizers, <coughs> what is this? Okay, this is interesting. It's alarm. Um, <laughs> I continue, I guess, oh. yeah, it's, oh. Jesus. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Um, <laughs> so we're here today to talk ocean alkalinity enhancement, which is a marine carbon dioxide removal approach starting to get quite a bit of attention uh, from academia, philanthropy, the private sector and the public sector. And so there is an urgent need to learn if, how, and when OAE can work at scale to identify potential impacts um, and to ensure that OAE research is responsible, transparent, and inclusive. So that's what we want to do with a, a new publication, brand new, um, hot off the press, called The Guide to Best Practices in ocean acidification enhancement research uh, that we are officially launching today uh, with, um, with many co-authors uh, on board here on the, on the stage. So the guide aims to advance scientific knowledge of OAE, but it's also addressing legal and ethical aspects, uh, social aspects, sorry, ethic ethical considerations, data sharing and monitoring, reporting and verification. So we will have, uh, just to inform you, we will have the honor to be joined a little later today, today this morning by His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco, who will join us for, um, to listen to, to a, our concluding session. When His Highness enters the room, I will kindly ask you to stand. Just a heads up. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm delighted to, um, to present to you our distinguished panelists, and um, I think I will take, take the seat here. So we had um, planned to have Oliver Geden. He could not make it this morning. He's uh, sick, unfortunately, but we have uh, another five panelists who will make up this great panel today. Um, so, um, we have Andreas uh, Oschlitz from uh, Geomar Helmholtz uh, Center for Ocean Research, Kiel, Jean-Pierre Gattusot from CNRS, uh, Sorbonne University, uh, and we have Adam Sabhas uh, from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, Institution, online, uh, and we uh, thought it was early here, early but here, it's but super here, early for Rob, <laughs> who is joining us. Uh, it's about five in the morning or something. Um, from University of Hamburg, Hamburg, Hamburg Rob, Roberts, Robert, Robert, Robert. Stenkamp. And we have Lydia with um, uh, Lydia Kapsenberg with CEA Consulting okay. and, uh, and uh, representing uh, her Climate Works Foundation today on the panel. 
So we will start with a round of short introductory, un introductory remarks, and then we will try to have a more conversational panel, let's say, for the second part. So um, let's see if I can work this out. I'll start with Andreas, because, yeah, of course. I'm so sorry, we will, <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't realize. So we will have a few introductory remarks from uh, the president of CNRS, the yes, French yes. National uh, Research uh, Center, Antoine Petit. Sorry, hello to all of you, I'll be very brief, I don't want to be an outsider, but really I think that this, uh, this session illustrates the importance of, of science and of knowledge. Uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement is clearly promising, but uh, it clearly also has to be studied, and we need to share the good practices, we, sh we need to share knowledge, we need to open all uh, the, the data that we have around this, uh, these techniques, uh, and precisely this, this guide that I had a quick look on it this morning is, uh, is really fascinating, and uh, it's so important to share. And so thank you to all of you uh, to, to, of course, have, uh, have built this, uh, this uh, guide, but also who show us the path that we have to, to follow in order, once again, to share the good practices and to, to, to use these techniques in all what you will have uh, of positive, but also to prevent a, a, a misuse of it. And clearly, uh, science takes time, and, uh, and we, we still have to learn. And it's important to not go too fast. We all know that the, the planet needs to go fast, but nevertheless, uh, we have to, to, to pay attention to that, and that's why science is so important, and why you have a, a lot of uh, to, to, to learn to us, but also we have to learn together by sheer knowledge. So thank you very much for this session and for all what you, you, you did, and mainly all what you do and what, all what we do together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Antoine Petit, for those opening words. So Andreas, um, you are Earth System Modeler. Uh, you co-lead the German CDR Mare uh, research mission on marine CDR. And you also co-chair the UN Ocean Decade program, Good, the Global Ocean uh, Oxygen uh, Decade. Uh, and you are the scientific coordinator of this guide uh, and was leading this effort together with Jean-Pierre. So I'd like to start uh, with you. Can you help us set the scene and tell us about what is carbon dioxide removal? And um, what, does, yeah, what does the last IPCC report tell us? Do we need CDR? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So I will start with two figures from the most recent IPCC assessment report. And this is one a generic scenario, ambitious climate scenario that uh, has no vertical scale, but it applies to all industrialized countries. It applies globally. Um, and it is the emission for the century. The horizontal axis has the scale of this century. So we see drastic emission reductions as needed. That's, uh, that's unavoidable if you want to reach climate goals. So it's an, about 90% has to be done by emissions reductions. That's the blue bars. They go down by mid-century in a steep slope. They have to go down in these ambitious scenarios. But we see they don't go down to zero. We have residual emissions uh, that depends on, uh, well, societal decisions in the end. Nothing is unavoidable, but it depends on lifestyle, on uh, nutrition, and on uh, lifestyle mostly. Uh, so there's uh, some chemical industry, salmon production, and the dark blue one is uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gases, mostly from agriculture. And so we don't think, we don't know how to avoid these if we want to live, uh, well, as, uh, life as we think we will want to live it uh, mid-century. And to do, to compensate these and net zero, to stop warming, we need net zero CO2 emissions. That's physics, and uh, on this planet at least. So that there we have to reach net zero, and we can't, can do that only by accounting for the yellow stuff. That's the negative emissions. And you see we do some negative emissions today already. That's mostly afforestation or forest management. Uh, but we have to do much more <coughs> by mid-century and by the end of the century. That's the light yellow part. And this is called carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, CDR, that basically compensates for the residual emissions that we cannot or do not or 
do not want to avoid that we will have, but it, it can compensate only for about 10% of current emissions. So we will have to cut emissions, reduce emissions as fast and as steep as we can. Uh, next slide, please. Do I have? Yes, thank you. And so also in the IPCC report, a very busy plot here. That uh, there's the, some, some um, logos on the bottom. Uh, that uh, indicates what we think, science thinks right now, what could be done to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, these CO2, carbon dioxide removal. Like it's, it starts with trees on the left and uh, buildings using uh, CO2 and long-lived matter, like, like uh, wood buildings. Uh, agriculture, different farming, uh, soil carbon, it's all on land so far. That's where you can make a profit or can have a company that, where you have ownership of land and that's all relatively straightforward and we have done most of these things for many decades and if not centuries. So basically it's, it's known, it's no rocket science, but there are problems. There's uh, land requirement, uh, often nutrient or water requirements in these methods, and we have uh, competition with other users, but mostly food production. And so that's why the ocean part, even an IPCC, comes into play. That's the small blue part on the right here. Of course, the ocean is much larger than the small part. It's 70% of our globe. And that's where we now develop ideas to, to move away from this very well, mostly used land that we have for many different purposes to try to understand, can we scale up things better, since we have to compensate about these 10% of our residual emissions from today's emissions, uh, that's uh, several gigatons per year, can we do that better in the ocean? And that's where the ocean now comes into play. Could the ocean play a big role? And eventually, could ocean activity enhancement play a big role, I think? There, I give our hand over to, to Jean-Pierre. Yes, <laughs> perfect transition to, to Jean-Pierre. So Jean-Pierre, you are a CNRS uh, research professor at the Laboratoire d'Océanographie de Villefranche in France with Sorbonne University, and also an associate scientist with IDRI in Paris. You contributed to several IPCC reports, including the AR5 and AR6. And you also, as I said, co-led the production of this guide to best practices in OAE together with Andreas. So can you tell us more about now, so we heard about um, uh, CDR in general, can you tell us more about um, marine CDR and yes. ocean alkalinity enhancement? So, um, yes, on the left uh, plot here you have uh, this uh, figure is from uh, uh, Ocean Vision. It uh, summarizes the various uh, approaches that can be used uh, for uh, CDR, marine CDR. Um, what we are uh, talking about today, uh, so there is uh, ocean fertilization, uh, mostly by iron, uh, the increasing, you know, primary production by phytoplankton and export to the, to the deep ocean. Um, there is uh, a potential technique that I think now is not very well considered in the community, uh, artificial upwelling, uh, because it brings uh, nutrients to the surface together with uh, a lot of uh, carbon. Um, on the left hand side, uh, you have uh, blue carbon ecosystems, uh, like a restoration of mangroves, uh, salt marshes, and, uh, and seagrass beds. And uh, on, the, on the top, on the two uh, extremes, left and right, uh, this is uh, ocean alkalinity, alkalinity enhancements, which can take place uh, either uh, in the open ocean, as, as is seen in the middle, I think, uh, and uh, it can be also performed on land. And we see better on the right-hand side uh, plot uh, uh, figure, uh, which is extracted from, uh, from the guide uh, to best practices. Uh, so um, the principle of uh, ocean alkalinization is uh, to increase, uh, it's like an anti-acid that we add, uh, that is added to the uh, seawater. Enabling seawater to m store, uh, uh, to mop up uh, more CO2 from uh, the atmosphere or from the surface ocean. Um, so the goal being, of course, to reduce uh, carbon dioxide in, uh, in the atmosphere. Um, this can be done by adding alkaline rocks uh, that you see the boat here delivering uh, alkaline material um, in the ocean. Uh, the, one of the drawbacks is, it, that, is that it requires mining, transportation, grinding of the stuff, uh, delivering it uh, in, the, in the ocean. Um, 
Uh, and uh, the other approaches are based on land, uh, basically uh, wastewater or um, seawater are pumped uh, on land in a chemical reactor uh, where alkalinity is uh, added and uh, there is a pre-equilibration of uh, CO2. So CO2 is uh, uh, really removed, uh, can be removed mostly on land and then uh, um, the, the seawater goes back uh, to the um, to the ocean with an increased uh, concentration of um, uh, carbon um, bicarbonate and carbonate which do not uh, exchange with the atmosphere so the goal here is to transfer co2 that is uh, contributing to the greenhouse effect into material carbonate and bicarbonate that are neutral uh, to the atmosphere and, and can remain in the ocean for extended period of time the next uh, slide if you like yes i'm I wanted to to ask you about the the process of the of the guide, because yes. it was quite an intense process. It was published on Monday in State of the Planet. Can you tell us a bit more about how it? Yes, was it's produced? it was a, a fantastic experience to lead uh, this activity with uh, Andreas. Uh, we had uh, um, uh, the funding from uh, from Climate Works uh, and the support from the Prince Albert. The, the second of Monaco Foundation came uh, in September uh, last year. We had the first meeting of the lead authors in January this year, and, and six months later, we have this guide uh, published um, in a peer review journal. Uh, that is, uh, the journal is uh, new, it's a Copernicus journal called The State of the Planet. So it has, uh, we cover seven topics. There are 13 papers in, in the guide, uh, each paper has its own DOI. Um, and those papers also are chapters of the guide. Uh, it is qu quite well done, you will see that. Uh, 53 authors uh, in the guide, and uh, it went through the traditional review process in the Copernicus journals, a two-step process, open to the community. And uh, we are very delighted to do that. It has been a very intense uh, period uh, for many of us, uh, but uh, we are very pleased with the res results. So the goal is really to uh, speed up uh, knowledge uh, on, um, uh, on ocean alkalinity enhancement and sharing uh, this knowledge. Um, we did a similar exercise in 2010 uh, with a guide to best practices for ocean acidification research, and the uh, authors are also here in the room. Um, and it has uh, helped a lot uh, ocean acidification research to uh, pick up speed. Um, so uh, the goal is that resources uh, available to research are used uh, most effectively, that uh, the research is conducted responsibly and transparently. We have a strong uh, message in, this, in the guide about that. Um, we want to ensure that the results obtained by, uh, within several projects can uh, be compared uh, uh, including for modeling approaches, uh, facilitate synthesis uh, on uh, the different research efforts. The public debate, it's a very important aspect. Uh, we really uh, want uh, to, to make sure that this uh, approach is, uh, if it is developed at a large scale, is acceptable by the public. That public acceptance is absolutely crucial. Um, and also responsible governance. We have uh, a section, uh, Robert uh, will uh, tell us about it on, uh, on law governance. There is a section on monitoring, uh, reporting, and verification too. So it's quite complete, and I hope it will uh, help the community. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. So, Andreas, can I give the mic back to you for a second, just to elaborate? So we heard uh, from Jean-Pierre what the guide is hoping to achieve. Can you elaborate a bit on why it's so important to have, or for OAE research to be transparent, inclusive, um, and responsible? Yes, so, well, from, from the geological past of the planet, we know that uh, alkaline enhancement does work on long time scales, hundreds of thousands of years. It has always helped the, the planet to stay within the habitable zone and to remove CO2 after some major continental breakups uh, back into the ocean, dissolve it as uh, salts of the carbonic acid, and basically neutralize it by, by dissolving carbonate sediments or 
today corals in some extent uh, parts. So, uh, so the question is, could we speed it up? And the potential is, is large, so it could uh, chemically uh, ha can, can absorb all our anthropogenic emissions, but could we speed it up fast enough uh, to, to and, and in some acceptable way, benign way, to help us uh, compensating part of a substantial part of our residual emissions? And so we don't know this. We have an insufficient knowledge base. We don't have much time. So mid-century uh, gigaton scale removal has to happen in order to meet the net zero targets that many uh, governments have, have issued and are enshrined in law in many countries. So this potential has to be studied and uh, we need the scientific understanding. We also need the transparency to, to do that in public and uh, there's a number of efforts. Uh, philanthropy is moving into this, so money is going into this to help scientists, have, help startups go ahead to try things out in the ocean. Um, but this is a well risky <laughs> endeavor if we don't share information and if we don't talk about it and if we don't learn from so-called failed experiments. And that's our main reason in science, usually most of the experiments fail, but that's where we, how we learn. And uh, experiments that do run well, as expected, are pretty boring, and you don't learn since you knew it before. So you learn from the failed experiments. And we have to, to, to transport this, and that doesn't fit well with many startups, of course, with the philosophy of making as much money as we can, and uh, convincing your funders to give more money to your company. And so we think we need this uh, guide to put it up on the table. We can't enforce it, we, but we can ask everybody to take position. Do you follow the guide? Why not? If not, and uh, this is the chance we have and you have and the uh, society has, uh, funders have, philanthropy has, to, to confront everyone experiencing and trying to help us understanding ocean alkalinity enhancement better uh, to take a position with respect to the guide. And uh, information exchange is the most important thing, transparency, probably also a, a registry of planned field experiments that we can use this uh, asset of field experiments. It's very expensive and a best way to allow others to, to observe it as well, to, to, well, just share ideas, information. Yeah, and that's what we think and hope will speed up knowledge generation so that maybe Ocean alkaline enhancement can help us uh, to a tiny bit at least to help the climate problem. Thank you. Did you want to also say a word about Jean Pierre already mentioned um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, but in I types think that's of. That's fine. Yeah, it's okay. We, that's good. All right, then we move to, to Adam. You're a biogeochemist with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and co author of the guide. Um, so there are different sites in the world where uh, there are natural gradients, right, of alkalinity that can be used as analogs for ocean alkalinity enhancement. Can you tell us more? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I am a carbon biogeochemist, a chemical oceanographer, and I study the natural alkalinity cycle on the planet. You know, this approach of ocean alkalinity enhancement, it's not coming out of nowhere. There's a really vigorous and active alkalinity cycle that already occurs every day on the planet. Um, and there are unknowns in how this natural al alkalinity cycle works and how um, our knowledge, building that knowledge of this natural alkalinity cycle can hopefully give us another window into how ocean alkalinity enhancement as a carbon dioxide removal technique might scale in the future. So for instance, you know, most of the alkalinity enters the ocean actually from rivers. You can see a picture of the Mississippi River and its plume in the Gulf of Mexico up here. Um, studying these river systems, how this alkalinity enters the ocean, what happens to it, what are the feedbacks, what are these sort of environmental impacts of this um, huge source of water, right, the mighty Mississippi entering the ocean um, is, is very interesting and important. Um, you have more, uh, enclosed basins with really enhanced alkalinity. So think of places like the Black Sea or maybe some fjords like this fjord in Alaska. All that, all that milky uh, material, that's all glacial rock that is very finely uh, powdered and it is dissolving. It's producing alkalinity in these systems. And we can learn a lot from, uh, from these systems and how it applies to uh, monitoring and, and uh, deploying ocean alkalinity enhancement. You know, the major sink of alkalinity today is the formation of calcium carbonate minerals, so things like coral reefs, 
carbonate sediments. Um, one of the classic places to study this is the Bahamas. Um, and so there's a lot we don't know about the formation of calcium carbonate, how that relates to ocean chemistry. And so there's a lot we can learn from the natural system. And of course, you know, we've been studying these things for decades and we've developed a lot of really great tools to study these things. And as a community, you know, we're starting to shift our, our focus into applying some of these tools to actually studying ocean alkalinity enhancement field experiments. So for example, you know, we're really excited. We're, we're um, in the process of gearing up to do a field experiment of ocean alkalinity enhancement as a kind of schematic of what, um, what that experiment might look like. Um, we're throwing basically every tool, oceanographic tool that we have at this problem. Um, and um, what we hope to come out of this, right, is, is as Andreas and, and Jean-Pierre said, is a really kind of transparent, um, open, experiment where we can share all of the data, make sure we have redundancy, and um, develop this technique um, together with this whole community. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. So I'll move on quickly now to, to Robert, who is still with us online. You're a South African trained jurist uh, and a senior um, researcher at the University of Hamburg. So you're researching the legal and governance aspects of ocean alkalinity enhancement, and you also are a, a co-author of the guide. Can you uh, talk about some of the, um, the key messages coming out of your chapter of the guide, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nina. <clears throat> Um, so I think as you've uh, maybe hasn't really been highlighted just yet is that what you'll see on my side over there, of course, as the lawyer in the room, it's my job now to make things a little bit more boring by, by not showing you any pictures. Um, but one of the key things that, that those things that you see on the slide were used to, to come up with the key recommendations um, is that there's this inherent tension between, on the one hand, the, the want or the need to use OAE and, and similar marine CDR technologies, and on the other hand, the need to protect um, the environment and, and society at large. So I think in, in the interest of time, I won't go into too many details, but uh, perhaps I could highlight four of the, the few recommendations that came out of the chapter. Um, and uh, the first one is that many of these projects, um, when they do get to the stage of, of wanting to start research in the, in the field, in the open ocean, in, in, in ocean ecosystems, is that national authorities are gonna have to issue permits for, for these sorts of things. So on that basis, I think it's gonna be essential that, um, that governments are encouraged to fulfill their, their obligations that they have at the international level um, when they adopt certain national legislation. So they need to make sure that they're busy incorporating um, agreed international rules and standards. Um, and then to, to move to a second recommendation that came from, from, from the work is that I think researchers um, are going to have to really, part of what was already said at the start of, of today, is they're going to have to really keep in mind um, some of the ongoing regulatory initiatives and developments that are happening so that their research is at least familiar with what's going on. And, and I think here specifically of the, the London dumping protocol, we have a, a 2013 amendment there that's not in force, um, but there's a lot of ongoing work there that may have some help or at least some guidance to provide for, for OAE research. Um, third, uh, quite related to this, is that the, the London Protocol has this assessment framework to, to actually give us an idea of how we should go about designing um, experiments. And it might be that we can transpose many of those things that already exist within in the London Protocol, for instance, to, um, to OAE or planned OAE experiments. Um, and then lastly, maybe something that is very obvious, but I think it's, it's important to state is that OAE projects really need to, they really need to be designed to maximize benefits and, and, and mitigate the negative consequences. And this is a very obvious statement, but it's certainly the cornerstone of most environmental regulation that's, that's in existence today. And uh, as Andreas has already alluded to, this is going to, this is going to require a high level of transparency when we, when we design both the projects and the scientific side of things but as well as when you're interpreting and, and designing any governance framework so that scientists have certainty as to what it is that they have to do so that they're legally complying. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rob, for that. We will move forward quickly. You're a bit limited uh, on time here. So I'll move to, to Lydia now. And uh, Lydia, you have a mic, hopefully. <laughs> uh, PhD in marine biology. You're a consultant, as I said, with CA Consulting, um, working among the others with um, Climate Works Foundation, who were very grateful to for support financial, financial support for this guide. So you have um, 
you saw the need, let's say, for for this guide uh, quite early on. Uh, you were involved also in the. You've seen. Um, you, you, researching also ocean acidification, and you saw the impact of that guide that Jean-Pierre was alluding to before. Um, what are your, um, can you, um, how, can you talk about why this guide was something that Climate Works Foundation was inclined to, to support, and what are your expectations for, for this guide? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to uh, the authors for producing such a, an impressive document on a very short timeline. Um, I'm representing Climate Works Foundation. I've been working as a consultant for them for the past four years um, the, for the full duration of their Ocean CDR program. So um, Climate Works is kind of the first pooled philanthropic funding initiative dedicated to exploring CDR approaches, and um, Marine CDR is one of them. So their goal is really to provide the resources, because there's not much public funding going into this yet, to understand what can be possible, what can be safe, is it feasible, and generate help generate the data that will be needed for decision makers, get people at the table, get people educated about um, uh, marine CDR. So some of their early efforts was um, the NASM report on marine CDR, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with. Um, some of the road mapping efforts by Ocean Visions, development of the Aspen Institute, um, code of conduct. And so as uh, they were also beginning to fund r research, so like Adam Shubas's um, project in the Mississippi River, for example, um, we saw just a growing interest in ocean alkaline enhancement and marine CDR at large. And so with my previous research experience in ocean, um, ocean acidification, um, I think jump here's statement of that guide, you know, helping build the field is a bit of an understatement. It like really blew open the field and it allowed labs who previously were not working on carbonate chemistry to fully pivot into it. So I came from a lab that did marine ecophysiology work and then became very much um, a contributor in ocean acidification research thanks to these guides and the, the um, um, workshopping and education they did around that. So we thought there's um, an important, you know, an important aspect of helping people pivot into this space, but also to channel research and not have the fields balloon in a way that's going to make it really hard to synthesize for that process. So um, I reached out to Jean-Pierre and Andres Austerlis and first thought maybe we can have a guide on marine CDR. That was way too big. So um, it turned into the guide on ocean alkalinity enhancement. And my hope is that this guide will set a precedent for um, broad CDR research, marine CDR research. There's a lot of lessons and recommendations in this guide that will apply to more than just ocean alkaline enhancement. Um, and um, I also hope to see a lot more um, labs and experts who can really contribute to this project now being able to pivot into this um, area of research. It's, it can be kind of daunting to get up to speed on marine CDR. It's very fast moving. And so I think this guide will be really instrumental in growing the field and growing it in a direction that really lends itself to synthesis and helping people who are making the decisions um, have the right information in hand. Thank you so much. I think uh, we don't have a lot of uh, time for uh, follow-up questions. The, the prince will join us soon, I think. But I would like to uh, maybe skip a few questions that we have thought of and go to you, Jean-Pierre, just to say quickly something about the biological impacts. We haven't talked too much about that, of okay, yes. potential impacts of OE. Yes, um, and of course, uh, that is a worry for uh, a lot of us, uh, that... Uh, Startups are uh, starting to uh, work on this and do pilot uh, studies, and uh, they go, uh, in my opinion, they go too fast. Uh, they go ahead of science, and uh, I think it's, uh, it can lead uh, to a problem. And one of the risks, of course, is that uh, uh, this addition of alkaline material uh, could lead to negative uh, biological impacts. Um, so we don't want to, uh, this to happen. So research is uh, starting. I think this year, uh, three papers were uh, published, uh, very, very limited knowledge, but three papers were published on the impacts, biological impacts of increased alkalinity. In principle, um, uh, increasing alkalinity shouldn't be a problem. It, it is a technique that has been used uh, for, uh, since the 60s 
in rivers and lakes uh, to compensate, you know, acid rain. Uh, so liming of uh, rivers and lakes have been done uh, without uh, uh, any major issue. It's also alkalinity is added uh, um, in the north uh, east coast of the U.S. Uh, uh, to help uh, shellfish uh, in, um, on the seashore uh, to uh, increase uh, their growth and their calcification. And uh, I mean, shellfish farmers uh, seem to be very happy with it. The point is that uh, some of the material that could, could be added in the future um, will be mined. Uh, some of the, um, the rocks uh, contain uh, metals uh, that can be um, detrimental to uh, biology, and uh, like uh, nickel, manganese. Um, so there could be uh, some kind of pollution and uh, going uh, associated with uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement. So it's very critical to estimate those uh, risks uh, uh, before uh, full-scale deployment. Of course, and that's where the guide comes in, right? Uh, Adam, I think we have a, a few more minutes. If you would like to talk to us about MRV, that would be great. Yeah, so, um, so MRV stands for Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification, and this is the framework that, um, you know, governments, companies, uh, stakeholders might use to assess how, how much carbon is removed and how durable that, that carbon removal is. And so, you know, in the early days of sort of developing ocean alkalinity enhancement as a carbon dioxide removal re approach, we need to be thinking about how the research we do can be aligned with sort of generating these MRV methodologies um, uh, you know, transparency is a big part of that, making sure that um, this data is open and available for anyone to kind of check our results and make sure that, um, you know, they come out with the same number as we do. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it may also require um, ocean modeling, right? So we may not be able to do this with measurements alone. Um, and developing those ocean models in tandem with field experiments and with observations in the ocean is really, really critical. Um, because obviously it, it's a huge expense to go out and actually do oceanographic research. It's, it's really expensive to get a ship out in the middle of the Pacific, right, and, and, and make those observations. And so models are gonna play a really critical role, both in terms of um, broadening the scope of those observations um, but also driving the cost down of um, the cost ultimately of CO2 um, and what society is willing to pay for um, for, this, for this approach. So I think both of those things are really critical. And again, there's a whole chapter in this guide about um, key recommendations for MRV in ocean alkalinity enhancement and, and how we see this, um, this field growing in that regard. Thank you, Adam. Anyone wants to say? Yeah. MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification, is absolutely essential. Uh, the reason is uh, that we have seen um, lots of scandals on land with forestry, where uh, carbon credits were given, uh, and those credits were worth zero, nothing. Um, you can be sure that when there is money to be gained, uh, there, there will be crooks around uh, to try to get the money without uh, a lot of efforts. Um, so it's very critical that uh, you know companies doing CDR uh, report in a transparent manner, and in a manner that is very verifiable by everybody. It should be fully transparent. Um, it will be a, a, a disaster if uh, carbon credits start to be uh, located uh, for uh, projects uh, which have have not proven that they have uh, stored uh, CO2. That is uh, very critical in my view. Very good point. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes, so maybe Lydia can ask you to say something quickly about acceptability, because it's OE could be could be potentially quite difficult to to accept culturally and, and socially. What are your thoughts around this um, acceptability and ethical considerations around OE? Yeah, it's uh, hugely important. And when we talk about scalability, we're often still talking about the theoretical potential of different marine CDR approaches. Um, but the realistic scalability will be really heavily influenced by policy and whether society is going to accept this. 
um, and for how long. If there are some side effects that can be observed, but they're not maybe huge relative to climate change, um, it's acceptable. We still need continued trust from communities to be implementing those kind of projects. Um, and I think um, a really there's a lot of work happening on how to build that trust. So the Climate Works funded the creation of a marine research code of conduct um, with the Aspen Institute that was just published. I think this represents kind of a first step um, to help people get familiar with how to approach research, how to go into communities, how to also broaden research to the countries that aren't currently working on marine CDR. Um, it's really important that everybody have a seat at the table. So. Um, governments, NGOs, startups, local communities, indigenous communities, ocean users, um, we all have to have a chance to participate. And so early stakeholder engagement with research design, especially as this research moves into the field, is going to be really important to build trust, transparency, that's been mentioned and emphasized a lot here, um, is really critical that we yeah, develop trust, have an ethical approach and a just approach to investigating whether or not this is going to be a, a kind of solution that we should be implemented and how. And um, yeah, there's, um, I think the field is doing a pretty good job so far, but there's, of course, a lot at stake and there's risks that, you know, one misstep in a field, intentional or not, probably an unintentional, um, can really set the field back. And so we're hopefully with these kind of guides, um, new regulations, um, you know, participation of public funding bodies, uh, code of conduct, the AGU is developing a similar code of conduct that will integrate, I believe, the Marine CDR code of conduct developed by Aspen. Um, it's all very important for inclusive approach to this. Andreas, do you like to add to that? Yes, uh, a particular challenge is that we have uh, non-biotic processes here, so chemistry, that often sounds uh, dangerous and we don't like it from school and our experience and memories. Uh, and biology sounds much more green and what we do every day. But uh, in the end, I think for public acceptance, that right now that's, that's critical to, to tell what is going on here. But uh, uh, ocean acclimate enhancement can really try to not mess with biology, not change ecosystems. The biotic methods are they intentionally change ecosystems. So, and and uh, that's a manipulation, it's an intended large scale, and that could have, uh, well, it will have ecological side effects, of course, these are intended. And here we have the maybe a benefit of being able to avoid a large part of this ecological perturbation, but we have to, well, anti-acid, that's a good, might be a term that is more useful than chemistry. Um, we will have to find out, but we have to be transparent. <laughs> that's our challenge here. But I think uh, we are, well, it's inter interesting times and we need your ideas, all ideas, all hands on deck, uh, to really explore what is uh, the best or the least harmful solution here. And uh, we think ocean alkalinity enhancement is certainly in the portfolio. Great. Maybe we have actually some time for a quick question from the audience. Yeah, here we have. Oh, the mic. Okay, uh, my name is Nian Zhijiao from China. I would like to. Uh, okay. okay, thank you very much for you guys for uh, sharing your, your points and your comments uh, from different angles, which is very uh, important and very useful. Uh, I have a uh, couple of questions, but uh, given the limited time, maybe uh, one or two. Uh, can any of you compare the uh, artificial uh, manipulation like uh, OAE and the, the natural process like uh, the um, uh, phytoplankton or seagrass photosynthesis? Both can enhance pH abruptly, yeah? but the, the little one is natural, and it can cause uh, uh, classification naturally. I mean, the carbonate uh, precipitation can take uh, occurring naturally uh, without much CO2 release because uh, the pH is, uh, is uh, over 10 or more than that. And the second question is about uh, the uh, learning protocol. Uh, have, uh, do you know uh, it's uh, uh, already allowed or not? It's on the process. I mean, for the OAE uh, to the uh, to uh, the name. Robert, yeah. Yes, Stand okay, up. thank you. Thank you for your question. Rob, do you want to? 
Yeah, so as far as the, the London Protocol goes, the, the very quick answer is that uh, the London Protocol itself is in force that prevents dumping. So in the context of OAE that may constitute dumping, which if there is a definition of, then the London Protocol would, um, would definitely apply. But what is important is that there, in, in 2013, there was an amendment to the protocol that is directly for the first time in, in international law um, trying to regulate OAEs or trying to regulate what they term marine geoengineering. Um, and it's not really directly regulated yet because these, these amendments aren't yet in force. Um, but I think as countries become more and more aware, and if you're following the discussions that are going on there, it's very, very likely that OAE will potentially be listed um, quite soon as an activity that may want to be considered within the amendment. So the, the short answer is no, not yet, but I wouldn't rule it out. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yes, thank you. On the uh, uh, spontaneous precipitation of calcium carbonate, that's what we do see in many experiments, particularly if, if we, you add particles, like just uh, dust of rocks. So there, there's particle reactions, large gradients, large omega oversaturation and precipitation of calcium carbonate in many experiments. So that might be one of the largest concerns that we find right so far from experiments, larger than the ecological impacts that we wanted to study. And there we need, uh, well, best practices to make sure this is monitored. So maybe all the silicate rock that you put in the ocean, it disappears, it dissolves, but then you end up with a lot of calcium carbonate precipitated and you have no gain for the uh, CO2 uptake, but you just change one mineral into one other, uh, which a lot of, costs a lot of money, but doesn't help the climate at all. So that's what we need, and that was a big surprise that we found it in so many experiments, this spontaneous uh, precipitation. And I think that's uh, what we will, well, it is addressed in the guide, and we would need guidelines, guardrails, how to avoid it, whether we need microbiology or a dissolution in reactors or, a, well, we, we don't know. But that's a research area. If I can do that, artificially to enhance the uh, amount of uh, precipitation of carbonates without uh, much CO2 release into the atmosphere, that would be the best. You know, when you do OAE, you have to do in the surface. Do you have any way to drag down this, the surface water into the deep? Because only in the surface they can uptake the CO2 from the atmosphere directly. Otherwise, you know, it's within the deep. It doesn't work, right? Yeah. Yeah, agree. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, we had one more. Jana, did you have a question? Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, table discussion this morning. Uh, my name is Jana Friedrich. I'm from the Marine Environmental Laboratory of the International Atomic Energy Agency based in Monaco. And two of my colleagues uh, had been co-authors of the guide, Marc Metian and uh, Sam Dupont, on the constraints and recommendations for experimental setups. But that's not my question. So my remark is about the scalability of ocean alkalinity enhancement and the timescales. Uh, I agree it took place on geological timescales, but the solution of calcium carbonate doesn't easily occur in the, in, in the surface of the ocean. And just as a... As an image, if you would counterbalance the annual CO2 uptake in the ocean, if you know Monaco, it's surrounded by limestone rocks, carbonate rocks. If you imagine a six kilometer long coastline, thousand meter high, one kilometer into the land, that would have to be grinded and thrown into the sea every year. So is this really feasible? And then you quickly address already the biological counter uh, impacts of the heavy metals that could be that will inevitably dissolve from uh, olivine or other minerals to into the ocean. Andre, go ahead, Andres. Yes. Uh, so scalability, uh, well, uh, it's, it's about if we have 10% of the current emissions as residual emissions and if we want to compensate them by OAE, then we need the mining operations of the amount of current coal mining. And, and so that's not nothing we cannot do. Of course, there's huge uh, harm on, on land and ecological damages and all things, but it's, it's not 
nothing completely new that uh, the planet hasn't seen it, that humans haven't done so far. So we think we could do that. It's not rocket science, but it's, of course it needs best practices as well. Uh, but scaling it up in, in time, that's the critical thing, since we don't do any, maybe a few kilograms to a few tons per year so far in, in all of these experiments together. And scaling this up to, to millions, hundreds of millions to gigatons within a few decades, that's extremely challenges, and uh, I, I don't think we can... I don't see a good path, but what, well, we, we can't stop, we can't do nothing, so we have to try. And the dissolution itself, it's, I think it's not, not, a, not an issue in the end. It can dissolve, uh, limestone can dissolve in oxic, anoxic waters, acidic waters, like in the Baltic Sea, within uh, a year or so. So that's what, that's what we see from cross erosion of uh, the, the uh, limestone there. Once it hits anoxic waters, just a few, well, 10, 20 meters below sea surface, it, it dissolves in um, annual time scales. And uh, silicate rock, olivine, it depends on the grain size, it depends, maybe you can do it on chemical reactors on land, on a ship, but, but it, it's not impossible or electrochemically. Uh, so this dissolution time, I think, is not, not really uh, limit, stopping uh, the method from having the potential, at least. It's mostly the... Um, issues on land so far that we see. Uh, the uh, contaminations uh, with trace metals, heavy metals, so far in, in these uh, lab experiments haven't shown major shifts. So the dominant effects were uh, fertilization effects, due to silicate and iron. But we couldn't, uh, or those three papers that came out this year, last one only last week, uh, is uh, found mostly an enhancement of productivity of, of different algae species in a, in a lab, in a container, in an aquarium. So it's not, not the real world. We need these field experiments to see longer-term effects, longer than a few weeks, and to see uh, possible impacts on the ecosystems. That's what we don't know. But so far, we don't have strong indications that uh, there are such strong effects. Adam, would you like to add yeah. to that? Uh, yeah, if I may, you know, I think it's it's easy to to throw out a, this is the number of square kilometers of limestone that we need to dissolve to do this. I think that is just a restatement of the CO2 problem, that this is a massive problem. We're talking about billions, you have 40 billion tons of CO2 every year that we're pumping into the atmosphere, and we need to do something about that, right? Um, we need to reduce our emissions globally. Like, that is just a, that is the number one thing that we need to do, um, and we need to do it soon, right? And then, what do we do about the rest? And I think the, the where the science is leading us, right, is that there's a lot of uses of land. It's going to be very difficult to get the land to meet this, this requirement of carbon dioxide removal, and that has pushed us into the ocean. And um, from our perspective, you know, the scientific perspective is that ocean alkalinity enhancement is a really promising approach to do this carbon dioxide removal at scale. Um, in terms of getting it to that scale, you know, we need responsible research. We need to be doing this in conversation with the global community, with regulators, with policymakers, with stakeholders, and we need to be making sure that um, our experiments are, are, are appropriate for the scale, right? And right now, we, we've seen a lot of lab experiments. The next step, of course, is to be doing controlled field experiments, doing things in the ocean that is directly relevant for how we might regulate and control this um, to make sure that we're placing appropriate limits on where this happens, when it happens, how it happens, uh, to do that in the most responsible way possible. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the, where our position on this, um, and it's something that um, I th we're hoping to, to push forward with this guide. Thank you. I think that we will have to to wrap up the session. So unfortunately, the Prince Albert, the Prince Albert the um, the second of Monaco, were not able to to make it here to the pavilion this morning. Really sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you everyone for a great conversation. Do you want to do uh, takeaway me messages? I think we have two minutes for do some takeaway messages, and then. We have prepared the slide, uh, concluding slide for um, 
for the prints, and uh, maybe you can show it now. Uh, so the it was a recap uh, that uh, uh, of uh, this uh, session. Uh, you know, none of the um, scenarios uh, looked at, uh, by the IPCC, none of those scenarios compatible with the Paris Agreement uh, uh, can do uh, can be performed without uh, CDR. Every scenario compliant with uh, uh, the Paris Agreement have uh, some level of uh, carbon dioxide removal. Um, the scale is uh, very big, as uh, Jana said. Uh, it's, uh, it is anticipated that the carbon dioxide removal would be between uh, 100 uh, and 1,000 gigaton CO2 over the century, which is uh, quite a, a large number. Um, many governments and uh, startups forget that uh, CDR is not a replacement for mitigation, um, that there are uh, multiple uh, approaches that can be uh, used in the ocean, and uh, the ocean has become very attractive because uh, of, as you said, uh, constraints on land with um, competition with uh, agriculture, uh, the, pro the issue of uh, water is uh, the water availability is uh, an issue on land. Uh, uh, the ocean is large. Uh, it has a very large surface area, which is good for CO2, uh, RC CO2 exchange. It has uh, chemical characteristics that are uh, very much amenable for storing a large amount of uh, carbon, uh, 50 times more than in the atmosphere. So uh, this uh, method appears uh, promising, but uh, we are advocating that more research needs to be done before large-scale uh, deployment. Carbon crediting, as you mentioned, that uh, needs to be kept honest and transparent. Uh, the experiments we advocate uh, need to be uh, fully published. Uh, we are aware of um, startups, companies, uh, not releasing uh, their, uh, their data, and I, uh, I believe it's a problem uh, that uh, that is not done. And we also advocate the use of a public registry uh, of OAE field experiments, because if uh, this uh, approach and other approaches of CDR tech uh, uh, I mean, um, increase in number, it will become very difficult to understand what is happening, and what the attribution will become extremely difficult. Uh, um, you know, this project has mopped up uh, so many tons, and this one, uh, you know, 200 kilometers away, how much has it uh, removed? So that uh, the public registry, I think it's very critical. I don't know a path for that uh, today, but um, hopefully it will happen. Thank you so much, Jean-Pierre, for those closing remarks. Thank you to any everyone uh, for making it here to this session at this early hour on behalf of all the organizers. We would like to thank you all. And uh, a round of applause maybe to our great panelists. Thank you.